Now, if you're here this morning, you remember I, we uh, started off. Keep your finger here. Keep a bookmark in Galatians 3. Turn back, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 37. Because we're going to be coming back to Galatians 3. Ezekiel is in the Old Testament. It's one of the major prophets. And we're going to turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. And I mentioned it this morning. I just Ezekiel 37 has two major um, points that are kind of being made. There's, there's two uh, stories being told. The first story that I preached on this morning was the story of, of the dead bones coming together where, where Ezekiel was prophesying unto the bones as God commanded him to. And God made all these bones come together and form bodies and the, and the, the sinews were, were coming up on the bones and the flesh and everything else. They were being brought back to life and, and the breath of life was breathed back into these people. And there's this great multitude, a great army for the Lord was created through this hard preaching by Ezekiel or by the prophesying of Ezekiel by the word of God. And we, we went through all the various, um, not all of them, but some of the... Um, things that we could learn, the applications, you know, I made the application of going out to the dead bones, if you will, of people who are not saved, people who are not regenerated, people who are dead in their sins, people who are hellbound because they don't have Christ as their savior and prophesying unto those bones and letting the word of God take root and bring life that those bones can live. And I went into a lot of detail on the resurrection because ultimately what the Bible was saying in Ezekiel 37 was that that was representing the house of Israel. And the house of Israel was the one that said, we have no hope. They felt like they were lost. They had no hope. And the answer to them not having hope was the promise of the resurrection. It was the promise of the good news of Jesus Christ coming and being raised again from the dead. It's the promise of our resurrection that we, even though our bodies will die, one day when Jesus comes back, our bodies are going to be raised again from the dead and we will get a new body and we will um, live with Jesus Christ and he's going to rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years and so on and so forth. That is, uh, that is what the first part of this chapter was about. But now I want to cover the second part of Ezekiel chapter 37 because the two are related. This concept of the resurrection and the, the prophesying of end times events, literally prophesying you know, not just Jesus Christ's resurrection, but the resurrection that we will see when Christ comes back again is prophesied in Ezekiel 37. So let's, um, let's pick up in Ezekiel 37 here. And we're going to start reading in verse number 15. We read this this morning. We're going to go over again tonight. Verse number 15, the Bible reads, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel as companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So there's two sticks. One of them he's writing is for Judah. The other one he's writing for Ephraim and Israel. And it's representative of the two nations that were divided in Israel as a whole. Okay, there's a nation of Judah and the nation of Israel. And um, so he makes these two sticks as God commanded him. And he writes on them. Verse number 17 says, And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. He's saying those two sticks are literally going to become one. It's like one, another way of miracles. Now, I'm going to pause right here because what, what's really cool when we'll be teaching today is a concept that's found very prevalently in the New Testament. And that's why we started off in Galatians chapter 3. That has to do with the house of Israel and who God's people are and, and all the, these, um, the doctrine that we have in this church. 
But I'm, I'm, what I want to show you is that we see the same exact doctrine being taught in the Old Testament as well. And it's taught here in Ezekiel chapter 37. And the way that the Old Testament was written, it, it has a lot more dark sayings. There's a lot more symbolism used. There's a lot more things being done. You know, we don't see the same type of teaching being done in the New Testament where he's saying, okay, take a stick and write on, take another stick and write on, put them together. And the way that he, you know, he used Ezekiel to do a lot of different things. He's like, cut off the hair on your head and, you know, take a third of it and, and throw it into the wind and take another third and burn it in fire. And, take a, you know, and he's telling them to do all these different things, right? Slice one up with the sword. He, he's telling them to do these various things because he's, he's, he's showing a greater truth. He's giving them like parables and examples, but they're kind of dark sayings. It's a way of communicating through these examples to kind of get people to understand what's going to happen, but it's not really necessarily crystal clear. And the Old Testament has a lot of places like that. But what we see in the New Testament is this big bright light shining and just clarifying everything and making everything from the Old Testament much more clear. And just the teaching in the New Testament itself is a lot more clear as well, just the way that it's taught. So we're going to read the rest here of Ezekiel chapter 37, and then we're going to go and shine the light of the New Testament to really get the full picture of what's being taught here. Um, if you've been coming to our church for a while, this isn't anything new for you necessarily, but um, it's just one more example of a truth that God is teaching. And, and you know what that truth is? The truth is, is that the physical nation of Israel, there's a nation right now that exists in the Middle East, it's called Israel. And a lot of people think that they are God's chosen people because you read about Israel in the Bible, right? You read a lot about Israel in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. There's, there's all kinds of stuff. And the reason why this is a big deal, and the reason, one of the reasons why I'm preaching on it again tonight is because there's an impact in our lives and there's an impact on people who want to support the nation of Israel because they think that is what a good Christian does. They think they're doing right by God by saying, well, we have to support Israel. We have to help them out. We have to bless them. We have to do whatever we can to help out our buddies Israel regardless of what they're doing is right or wrong, because we just have this Christian obligation to Israel because Israel's in the Bible. And it's foolishness. Because that is not what the Bible teaches. Israel was used as a nation to bring forth God's word, to be a lighthouse in a dark world. Yes, they were. They were chosen by God, going all the way back to Abraham, as a people that God was going to use to make his name known, to, to, to make people know who God was. And he did use them. And he raised up prophets among them that gave us the word of God. He raised up Moses. He raised up Ezekiel and Jeremiah. He raised up all these various people that helped to compile God's word. And for a while, they were under God's authority in the time of the judges. And even, you know, somewhat in the times of the kings, too, where they would look to God's law and look to God's word as being, hey, we are a people that has God as our ruler. We are a people that values God's word and we are going to live according to the Bible. That was the nation of Israel at one point in their history. Now, it's never been the entire group collectively. There's always been people that have, had, that, that have been stiff-necked and not receptive. But as a whole, that's who God was using to shine the light. So it did, there, there's definitely a reason for that. However, the covenant that he made with the people of Israel was a covenant that they weren't able to keep. There are people that want to teach that, oh, no, 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 this is an eternal covenant and that and, and basically what they're saying is that there is no way that that covenant could be broken, which is silly. Because, and I'm not going to go into all the details tonight. I've done this in the past. I really want to focus more on Ezekiel 37. But 
there are stipulations to God's covenant. Basically, it's the old covenant of keeping his law. And you know what? Just as much as we can't keep God's law completely today, the children of Israel weren't able to keep God's law then either. On our Wednesday night, we're going through the book of 2 Kings, and it's, it's evident. You see over and over again where they're not only in sin, but I mean, they're just worshiping idols. They're worshiping Baal. They're worshiping Satan, essentially, and rejecting God. Over and over again, they are breaking their covenant with the Lord. And as a result, even though God's long-suffering, even though God is patient, even though God gives them chance and opportunity after opportunity, he brings them profits, he tells them to get on the right path, he does all he can do to get these people back right with him. At the end, when Jesus Christ comes, he comes unto his own and his own receive him not. The Jews rejected Jesus Christ. And at that moment, that was the last straw that God has had enough with the people of Israel and using them. When they put Jesus Christ to death, he said, fine, we're done. I'm gonna, and, and God wasn't done revealing himself. God wasn't done you know, using people to promote his word. He just said, I'm done with the nation of Israel. Now, in saying that he's done, does not make people who are born of Israel or live in that land just completely unable to be saved. That's not it at all. He's just done using a specific, that specific nation to promote his work and, and to be the ones that were going to be the lighthouse and shining the light to the dark world. He says, you know what? You're just not doing it. You've dropped the ball. You've rejected me. Fine. I'm done. You could be just like any of the other heathen nations that have rejected God. And that's what happened. And we're going to see this here. We're going to see the, the references to Israel. And we need to keep this in mind. And we're going to see, the, again, the, the clear statements in the New Testament. But it's consistent with the Old Testament. On first reading of these passages, you're going to see Israel being spoken of. And your first instinct might be to think, oh, he's talking about the physical nation of Israel. And that they're going to come back and they're going to, you know, but what we're going to see in the New Testament is some more information about this, that it's not just talking about people who are physically descended from Abraham because God doesn't care where you physically came from. and Definitely not in the New Testament. Now, there was a purpose for the genealogies in the Old Testament. That purpose was for who was going to serve in the temple regarding the priests and the Levites. That's what he cared about when it came to genealogies is who was able to serve him because it was a special job. And he said, only these people are going are gonna to do this job. But when Jesus Christ came, the priesthood changed. We no longer offer goats and bulls and lambs as sacrifices. We don't need those priests to, to do the sacrifices and do the burnt offerings. Their job is no longer needed. Jesus Christ is the high priest. So the priesthood changed. And... When that happened, now there's even no more need for a genealogy. The Bible says that we shouldn't waste our time with genealogies. So God doesn't care who your parents were and who their parents were and who their parents were and who their parents were. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're going to get into all that in a little bit. Let's keep reading here, though. I, I kind of want to lay this foundation of where we're going with the sermon, and I want you thinking about these things as we read through the rest of Ezekiel because... As in the first part, the prophesying of the resurrection, which is going to happen when Jesus Christ comes back. It's a future event that hasn't happened yet. It's a prophecy. There's also this prophecy of the millennial reign of Christ found in Ezekiel 37 in this second analogy where he has the two sticks and he brings them together. So let's keep reading here. I think we left off in uh, verse 20. Look at verse number 20. And the sticks were on thou rightest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. 
And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. So as I was saying, as you read this, you start to think, well, he's talking about the nation of Judah, the nation of Israel, and just becoming one nation, and that he's going to bring those people together into one place, right? I mean, I could understand why you would think this because of the way it's written. But as we get into this a little bit deeper, and I'm going to show you why this isn't just talking about those physical people of Israel, and this is actually a future event. We'll see this as we go further. Let's keep reading. Verse number 23. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, <coughs> with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. Look at verse 24. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. Now, at this point in time, King David is long gone. In the days of Ezekiel, this is when they were being taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. David was the second king of Israel. Hundreds of years have passed since David was alive on this earth. Yet the prophecy is, is that in these times, that Ezekiel's talking about when the two nations are brought back together and that they're brought into their land, he says, David's going to rule over them. Okay? And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Forever. That's an, et that's, that's an eternal statement there. Now, do you really think, based on everything else you know from the Bible, that this is literally talking about King David from the Old Testament? That King David is going to reign forever and ever? No. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ is going to be the one that's ruling and reigning on, reigning on this earth when he brings the people, his people, believers, into the land and is king over them, and they aren't going to sin. They aren't going to break his commandments. They're going to follow everything that he says. The reason why it says David is because in the Bible, oftentimes people are referred to in their descendancy. So like... Um, it could be a son of David, but it still refers to it as being David because David was the progenitor of them. And Jesus Christ came of the lineage, physically, earthly speaking, of David. And some of the Old Testament prophecies refer to David when it's referring to the, the, the Savior, Jesus Christ, to come. Because in the Old Testament, they didn't know the name Jesus Christ, which was the name of the Savior. So it didn't, it's not going to say Jesus here. It's saying David because it's referring to the one who's going to come out of the loins of David. Verse 26, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. So God's sanctuary being in the midst of the people forever. Again, this is not talking about something that's already happened in the past. They already had the temple and the sanctuary prior to Ezekiel. This is a future event from then that hasn't happened yet. Verse 27, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. This is clearly referring to the time when Jesus Christ's kingdom is set up on this earth for multiple reasons. One, he's saying the tabernacle is going to be there. Two, he says David's going to be the king forever over those people. Three, we know that um, it says here that they're not going to sin, that they're going to follow the covenant, they're going to obey the laws. So this is going to have to be after we receive our new bodies. This is going to be when Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom. And in order for heathen to even be present, it's not going to be after that, you know, when there's a new heaven and a new earth, because at that point, there are going to be no more heathen because they're all going to be cast into the lake of fire. And then you have the, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and new earth, everything just completely done and, and no more sin. 
that happens after Jesus Christ rules and reigns for a thousand years. So the only thing that makes sense here and that fits is that millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So during that millennial reign of Jesus Christ, it's not just referring to physical descendants of Israel. It uses these terms, Jacob and Israel, because it's referring to the people of God. So flip back, if you would now, to Galatians chapter 3. Keeping that in mind and, and seeing where we, where we just read, because in verse 28, Ezekiel 37 said, And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. He's referring to Israel being sanctified at this time, during this millennial reign. So who is Israel? Galatians 3, where, where uh, Brother Sebastian read for us this evening, we're going to look down at verse number 7. We're going to reread some of this. The Bible says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. That's a very important phrase there. Because what the New Testament now... Well, you know what? Let's just go back up and read this in better context. Because I really want to get a good grip on this and, and explain this thoroughly. Because we kind of just jumped in at a verse here and, and it's going to be better to get the whole thing. Let's go right back up to verse number one. The Bible says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently sent forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So what was happening with the Galatians is that they were trying to add works to their salvation. And he's saying, who's deceived you? Who's bewitched you into thinking that anything that you do is going to result in your salvation? It's, it's the faith that saves you. It's not, you know, he said, did you receive the spirit? Talking about the Holy Spirit that you receive when you put your faith in Christ. He's like, did you receive that by the works of the law, by keeping God's commandments? That's not how you receive the Spirit. You receive the Spirit by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Verse 3, are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? It's basically saying like you got saved. You got saved the right way. You put all your faith in Jesus Christ. He's saying, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You're saying now all of a sudden you're thinking you have something to do with it? After you've already believed the right way? Verse 4, have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So now it brings up Abraham. So even in the Old Testament, people were saved exactly the same way that they are today. is by faith. It's not by keeping the law. If Abraham had to keep God's law to be saved, he'd be in hell right now. Because Abraham was a sinner. Now, Abraham was a great man of God. He's, he's called the father of faith. He's, he, he's a great man, did a lot of great things, but he wasn't perfect. He wasn't Jesus Christ. He was a sinner like everybody else is. So if he had to keep God's law to be saved, he wasn't saved. Just like anyone else who's ever lived. And that's why the Bible says even as Abraham believed God, he had faith in God and it, it was, talking about his faith, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham was made righteous because he put his faith in God. He put his faith on the Lord. He trusted in a Savior instead of trusting in himself and his obedience to God's law. So it brings up Abraham, and that's now why we get into the context of verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Why? Because Abraham believed God has counted him for righteousness. In the same way, if you believe in God, you're just like Abraham spiritually. You can call Abraham your father because he believed in God and you believe in God. He says, that's who is a, ch a child of Abraham. But see, the Jews at this time in history and even today, were more focused on the fact that they descended physically from Abraham. And they were concerned about tracing back their genealogy to say, yes, I am of this tribe of Israel, you know, a, son, a child of Abraham. And that's what they relied on. They thought that they were special and that God treated them differently. And that like, and, you know, God is a racist. 
that he only cares about people who physically descended from, Israel, from Abraham and not about anyone else. And they had this superiority con uh, complex in their mind, which people all throughout history have had. There's always been racists in every, in every nationality, among every group of people. There's always been people who think that because I'm this race or that race or this color or from this area, that I'm better than you. The Jews had that mentality. And many of them still do today. They look at, at, at everyone else that's not a Jew as a goyim. And, and just use that as a, as a, you know, a, a term that, that's not, not a good term. So it's basically like a subhuman. But it's not every single person who's a Jew, who's a physical Jew today, has that attitude. Just like there's people of all other nationalities. There's white people. There's black people. There's Hispanic people that all think that their race is superior. But that doesn't mean all of them think that way, Right? But either way, it's all wicked because God doesn't care. God doesn't care where you came from. God doesn't care what country you're born in. That doesn't matter to God. What matters is in your heart. What matters is what you believe. And once you believe, you're a son of God. You are a child of God through virtue of faith, not your own virtue. Just putting faith in Jesus Christ, you are born again and you become a child of Abraham. And when we read about the promises and the covenants and the things that are promised to, to Abraham, promised to Isaac, promised to Jacob in the Old Testament, we end up receiving of those promises. Anybody who puts their faith in God ends up receiving of those promises. Now, we read in Ezekiel 37, but even in other places in the Old Testament, you could read Esther. I've done this in other sermons. Where, and we're not going to turn there tonight. Just stay in Galatians 3. But even in the Old Testament, people can become a Jew. You didn't have to be physically descended from Abraham. All you had to do was put your faith in the Lord. Believe the religion. Join yourself. If you lived in another country, you could move to Israel. You could join yourself to be of the, of the children of Israel. And the Bible says, even in the Mosaic law, that you treat them the same as everybody else. That there's, no, there's not two laws. One for one who was born in the land and one for what? No. He says, you all are treated the same way. That's God's law. It has nothing to do with genealogy and where you come from. But this was a big stumbling block for the Jews back then. They thought that they had a special pass in heaven or a special regard by God in heaven because, oh, we just, because of the house they were born into. As if anyone has any control of that and as if you could have any pride over that. You didn't do anything for that. What, you know, what, what do you think you are? Verse number 8. Let's keep reading here in Galatians 3. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. He's saying, Abraham got the gospel. So I thought the gospel was only a New Testament thing. Well, you thought wrong because the Bible says that Abraham was preached the gospel. Way back. Before Moses. I mean, Abraham. Before the law was even given, Abraham was given the gospel. Salvation's always been the same. Don't, don't be deceived by people who want to tell you that, oh no, in the Old Testament they had to do works, they had to do sacrifices, they had to do all these other things. That was part of the way they worshiped the Lord, and those were important things, but it was not their salvation. Verse number nine. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So if you have faith, he's saying you receive blessings just like Abraham. But see, this is the reason why the, the, the Zionist Christians who want to get the United States involved in these wars to support Israel are thinking that they're doing God's service because they read the verse and say, oh, you know, God's going to bless him that blesseth thee and curse him that curseth thee when he's talking to Abraham. When he's talking to Abraham in the Old Testament. And by the way, that word thee, that's one of the reasons why we use the King James Bible because the word thee is singular. It's not talking about all of the descendants of Abraham being blessed or not blessed or anyone who has anything to do with any descendant of Abraham ever for all time. 
is going to be cursed if you curse some random physical descendant of Abraham. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. He was talking about Abraham, the person. I'm going to bless him that blesses thee. Why? Because Abraham was a man of God. Why? Because Abraham was righteous in God's eyes. And if anyone contra you know, was going against Abraham, then God was going to curse him. If they're trying to curse Abraham and curse the work that Abraham was doing and prevent Abraham from doing the work of God, then God was going to step in. And if people were going to help Abraham out and bless Abraham, you know what? God's going to bless them. It's as simple as that. And if you are of faith, you are a child of Abraham, according to this, this passage right here. And God will give you the same blessings as well. What we really ought to be worried about is cursing the believers. That's who everyone ought to be worried about is you don't want to be cursed by God, then don't curse the believers in Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you what, the people who are living in that nation that, that the UN created in the 1940s called Israel is a, not a nation of believers on the Lord Jesus Christ, in case you didn't know that. In case you didn't know, the religion of Judaism teaches that there is a Messiah and that Messiah is not Jesus Christ. And you know what the Bible says about people who believe that? It says they're antichrist. It says they're of the devil. To believe that there is a Christ, there is a Savior, and Jesus was not the Savior. He's not the Messiah. That is wicked. And that's why I believe that is the most wicked religion on the planet today. It's Judaism. And there's a lot of wicked religions. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there's other ones that aren't bad. But the one that's teaching that Jesus Christ is not the Savior, is not God in the flesh, I mean, that's just blasphemous. And it's sad that, that there are people, well-intentioned people, who think they're doing God's service and just have no concept of Scripture at all. And this is why it's also so important that you don't just let someone tell you what the Bible says. You read it for yourself. Otherwise, it's so easy to be deceived. Anybody can go around pulling passages out of context like they do in Genesis saying, oh, we're going to bless him that blesses thee and curse him that curses thee and just go on and on and on about how we need to bless Israel when it's not even talking about Israel. It's talking about Abraham. But if you don't know your Bible, how are you going to know that? If you don't read Galatians chapter 3, well, oh, well, I mean, the Bible says if we have faith, we are children of Abraham. Then you have no idea when someone's lying to you. Read this book every single day of your life and don't let anyone deceive you. Let's keep reading here. Because in, in, you know, this, is, this is also interesting too because in verse, in verse 8 that we just read, and the scripture for seeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. He wasn't talking about blessing just the nation of Israel. He says all nations are going to be blessed. Why? Because it's the faith. Amen. It's not about one physical nation at all. It never has been. It's about those that put their faith in God they become that nation. That's who God cares about. It's not the physical descendancy. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And this is another passage, uh, Gary, that I was talking to you about earlier before church. I showed you the one in, in James chapter 2. James chapter 2, of course, says that if you don't, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you commit no, uh, no adultery yet, if you're a murder, murder, you're guilty of all, right? If you, if you keep the whole law and yet you're found guilty of one, in one point, the Bible says you're guilty of all, right? And this is basically saying the same thing because the law says the same thing. The law of Moses says the same thing, that if you keep all of the commandments, or if you, excuse me, if you don't keep all of the, every single one of the commandments, then you're cursed. And that's why we need a Savior, because the Savior came to take that. He was a curse for us. He took that curse so that we don't have to be cursed because we've already broken the law and has satisfied the judgment according to that. So if we think that the law is going to save us because we're a really good person, you're cursed because you have not kept the whole law, every single, every single aspect. Verse number 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, 
it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Verse number 12. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham, look at this, the, the blessing of Abraham, when God blessed Abraham, the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Again, it's always about faith. It's always through the faith. But the blessing that Abraham received is coming on to them that believe, coming upon us through Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading. I mean, I, it, it's like, it, it, it's hard to even expound on these words because in my opinion, these words are just so clear all alone. I don't understand how people can read this passage especially and walk away thinking that we have to treat the nation of Israel that rejects Jesus Christ different in a good way than anybody else and exalt them somehow. It boggles my mind. Verse number 15, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. Yet, if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So a lot of people want to point you to these promises that were made to Abraham, that God made. He made his promise. They say, well, God keeps his promise. And amen and amen. God does keep his promise all the time. God never goes back. He never breaks his word. God's promises are true, as sure as the day is long. But people want to say, oh, see, he promised that to Abraham and all of his descendants after him. And they'll say, that's why we have to just respect Israel as a nation because they're descended from Abraham. Well, let's see what Galatians 3 says. It says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not. He said he didn't say when he made this promise, Abraham, when he's made these promises, Abraham, he didn't say, and to seeds as of many, as of his many descendants. No, that's not what he said. But as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this is why we use the New Testament to understand the Old Testament better. Because when you go back to the Old Testament and there's promises made unto Abraham, it's possible to read the passages and think that he's referring to all of his physical descendants to come. I can see where you could come across with that understanding. If you only read the Old Testament, you could think that. But what we have here is a very, very specific clarification so that God says there is no misunderstanding this. When I was talking about the promises made to Abraham and his seed, I wasn't talking about all the people, all the descendants physically descending from Abraham. I was talking about one descendant, Jesus Christ. Because again, the lineage, the physical line of Jesus Christ being born on this earth came all the way through the loins of Abraham. That's the... <laughs> You can't get much more clear than this. Let's keep reading, though. We're going to go, um, where are we? Verse number 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law... It is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So what he's saying is that the law of Moses, the law that was given to Moses, it's the law of God, really. It was given 430 years after Abraham was made his promises. Okay. And what was happening, again, at this time, especially in the same thing today, people are relying in the law of Moses, how well they keep God's commands, in order for, to, for them to be saved. And he's saying, look, the inheritance, receiving an inheritance, how do you receive an inheritance? It's by being a child of someone, right? Being a descendant, right? I'm going to receive an inheritance from my parents when they die because I am their son. It makes sense. I mean, that's how inheritances work. 
it's not written into the law somewhere that I'm going to receive an inheritance from anybody. It comes as virtue of being a child of my parents. That's it. That's how inheritances work. So what he's saying here is that there were promises made to Abraham. And you see, though you don't receive those promises by obeying the law. The law came after God even made the promise. So the promise is received by inheritance, by becoming a son. That's how you receive the inheritance. And that's how you receive the promise, is through that inheritance. It has nothing to do with keeping the law and doing that because that doesn't give you an inheritance. The law is only going to make you a sinner because nobody can keep the whole law. It doesn't give you anything. It restricts you. That's what the law does. An inheritance, though, is a gift. It's something that's given to you. Verse number... So he's saying that the law doesn't disannul that. I mean, the promise was made. God doesn't go back. You know, just because there's a law now doesn't mean that that just voids the promise that was made. The promise is still there. Verse number 18, For if the inheritance be of the law, there's no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? So why is there even a law then? What do you mean? If, if, the, if the inheritance comes by promise, then why is there even a law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Talking about Jesus Christ. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. He's saying if there was any law that could have been made that was capable of providing life to a person, then God would have done that. But the law doesn't make people righteous. It, it, like I said before, it just makes you a sinner because it's telling you not to do things. That's what the law is. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. That doesn't make you good. It just means <laughs> you're not going to face a punishment because you're not doing these things. So the life doesn't come by the law. Verse 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Look at verse 28 because this is extremely important for, this, for the point. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither Jew nor Greek. So does the Jew matter to God? Does the Greek matter to God? Nope. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. God brings everyone together that's a believer in Christ and makes you one with him. He says, you're all one. I don't care what color you are. I don't care if you're what gender you are. I don't care what, you know, what your nationality is. Doesn't matter because he brings us all together through Christ. Just like he made those two sticks one, those two nations one, he's going to bring all of us together to be one through the faith in Jesus Christ. And verse 29 says, And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Four Gospels, then you've got the book of Acts, and then you've got the book of Romans. And we're Romans chapter number 9. All right, I'm going to try to get through this really quickly. There's a lot, there's so, there's just so much here. There's so much. Romans chapter nine, look at verse number one. The Bible says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. 
For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. You're going to see this in the writings of the Apostle Paul frequently. He has a desire. He has a burden. He has a yearning for other Jews. Because the Apostle Paul was a Jew. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, right? He grew up, you know, he, was, he was learning to be a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee and, and thought he was seeking God until he got saved. And then he realized, oh, that's false. And then he had this desire, hey, I want to reach my people, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's not meaning that you think your people are better than other people, but there's something, you know, having kindred, having, having people that you're related to, there's nothing wrong with wanting to reach those people. And that's what the Apostle Paul did. But see, the Apostle Paul was sent to preach the gospel to a whole bunch of other people. He was sent off to a bunch of foreign countries to preach the gospel to them. And he's saying his heart is so into this. He's saying, you know, if I could sacrifice myself for all of them to be saved, this is the heart that the Apostle Paul had. He's saying, if I could be accursed from Christ for their sakes, he said, I would do it. And really, that's the heart that Christ had because that is what Christ did for us. Christ came and took the curse in our place. But um, verse number 14, he says, Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. So he's, he's, he's demonstrating, he's showing that all these things did come to the Israel, excuse me, the Israelites, the people who physically descended from Israel. They were given all these things, and they were. The promises, the service of God, the giving of the law, they, they benefited in that regard because God was using those people at that time. Even though that's not ultimately what really matters, right? What matters is our faith. It always has. But let's, uh, let's keep reading. Here's verse number five. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God bless forever. Amen. Verse six. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. For they are not all... Israel, which are of Israel. So the Bible's saying that not everyone who physically comes from Israel is actually considered Israel in God's eyes. So they're not all Israel who are of Israel. Verse 7 continues, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. They're not considered to be children even though they are, they are physically of Abraham's seed. It says, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. Flip back if you were to Galatians, we're looking at Galatians chapter 4 now. We're almost done. We're just going to look at Galatians 4 and Matthew 21, and we'll, be, and we'll call it a night. So we see, we're seeing now, continue. We saw in Galatians 3, we saw in Romans chapter 9, that what really matters is not physically who you descend from. It's that, it's that promise. It's that faith. Galatians 4, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman and made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ Jesus." In all these passages, we're seeing heir, inheritance, heir, become, you know, becoming a, a, an heir of God and being a son and being, you know, being a son through faith, a son of Abraham, receiving blessings by being a son. As an heir, we're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. The same Jesus Christ to whom the promises were made and the covenant was all about. The inheritance was promised to Jesus Christ. That old covenant promising the land, right? When God was said, I'm going to give this land, when he was talking to Abraham, because that's one of the promises that was given to Abraham was, hey, look all around you. I'm going to give you all of this land. 
That was an old covenant promise to Abraham and to his seed. This is the reason why people say, again, another reason why people say, oh, well, see, God gave that land in the Middle East over to Abraham and to his descendants forever. That's why we have to defend them. That's why we have to help them get back into that land. And people are just have this physical mindset. When the promise wasn't made to his seeds as of many, it was made to one, and that's Christ. So it was made to Abraham, and it was made basically to Abraham because of his descendant. Because Jesus Christ was going to one day come from his, from his lineage. And when Jesus Christ came, that's who the promise really was given to. Because that land, and I believe this too, when Jesus Christ comes back and he sets up his kingdom, it will physically be in that land that God has promised unto him. That is where, because he's going to be in Jerusalem. He's going to be reigning from Jerusalem over all of the nations of the world. And that's where the believers are going to be serving him. Those that are saved, that land is going to be, that, that, that is an inheritance. That is, that, is, that is our inheritance. We are going to receive that because we are children of God because we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the heir. You have Christ in you. You are a joint heir with him. We're going to receive that land during the millennial reign of Christ. That's an heir. That's a promise that's given to us. Hey, praise God. That's good. You see a little bit how this ties into what we read or what we talked about this morning with the dry bones and that, the, that hope of the resurrection. But we have a hope of an inheritance as well. Being a child of Abraham spiritually the physical descendants of Abraham even if it is those people over there in that land today I, don't, I mean and there's dispute about that whether those are even physical descendants even if those are the physical descendants they have just as much of a portion in that land as the children of Hagar do now if you remember Abraham he was married to Sarah that was his legit that was his wife and for the longest time, they couldn't have a child. Now, God promised him. He said, hey, you're going to have a son. And Abraham believed God. And for a long time, he believed him. But, but years and years and years went by, and he didn't have a son. And one day, you know, they wanted to have the son, and they got sick of waiting for God. And there was a lapse of faith. And Sarah said, Abraham, hey, take my handmaid. Go in unto Hagar. That was one of their servants, someone that was working for them. Not his wife, but Sarah said, comes up with the idea, say, hey, well, you go in unto her, and if she has a child, then we'll do, basically, it'll be my child, it'll be our child. Like, we're just going to use this woman to, have, to, to, to be the person that brings forth the child, and then it'll be ours to raise. That was Sarah's plan. Instead of waiting for God to provide the son that he promised, they took matters into their own hands. And that's where Ishmael came from. Ishmael was actually Abraham's firstborn son. Right? And in the Bible, the firstborn son technically is the one who receives the inheritances. Right? And that would be the one that would be looked to as the heir. But he was not the child of promise. And he was not legitimate because it wasn't with his wife. But the child was born. Hey, he's a direct descendant of Abraham. So everyone now that directly descended from Ishmael, they could point all the way back to Abraham. But that doesn't matter either. Whether you're physically descended through Ishmael or Isaac, doesn't matter. The people that maybe are physically descended from Isaac, have no more right in that land than the, the physical children of Ishmael. They have the same rights, and it's none for either of them because a promise was made to Abraham and to his seed, which is Jesus Christ. That's who that land was really promised to. That's who has rights in that land, and it's anyone who's a believer. Um, I don't have this in my notes, but in Ephesians chapter 2, we read it this morning. Basically, the Bible, you could read this later, write down Ephesians chapter 2, read it later, where it says that 
ye who are, who are sometimes afar off have been made nigh through the blood of Christ, and that we are become you know, citizens of the commonwealth of Israel through faith in Jesus Christ, that, that we are basically citizens of Israel. But it's Israel which is above. It's, you know. Anyways, let's, let's look at Galatians 4. We're almost done. Verse 22. Verse number 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, what he's saying here is that he's using the children of Abraham as an allegory, as an example, as an illustration. Ishmael was born of a bondwoman, someone who is a servant, right? And that that represents doing things through the flesh because that was man's way of, of attaining God's promise instead of waiting and having faith on God and waiting for God to deliver on his promise. They took matters in their own hands. Isaac was the, the son of promise. Because God delivered on his promise. After Ishmael was born, he's, no, I told you this. When Abraham was 100 years old, over 100 years old, that's, that's when Isaac was born. That, God fulfilled his promise. Amen. And what he's saying, though, is that, okay, this is an allegory. This is an example. And he's saying that Jerusalem physically is like Agar, is like the bondwoman. It's like going through the law. And Jerusalem, which is above, is, the, is of promise. Because we're promised that inheritance. We are promised uh, Jerusalem, which is above. Not the one that's just on this earth physically. But let's keep reading. Verse number 27. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry. Thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. We, we brethren, this is written to Galatia, the church at Galatia, the Galatians, they're Gentiles. He's not writing this to Jews. And he's including himself, the Apostle Paul, with these Gentiles and saying, now we, you and I, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Greek doesn't matter if you're Gentile. Verse 29, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit. Even so it is now. Persecution comes on the true believers. It's always been that way. They that are born after the flesh, the children of the bondwoman, those who are in bondage by the law and despise the liberty that people who have Christ have because we're free from the curse of the law. They're trying to live under the law. They despise those that are not under the law and try to bring them back into bondage and persecute those. So the people that want to tell you, you have to keep the law, you have to do right, you have to do all this other stuff, is trying to bring you, says, no, it's just my faith that saves me. It's Jesus Christ that saved me. It's not me. It's not my obedience. The people who believe in the works always persecute the ones that don't. And that's the way it works. That's the way it's always been. The prophets of God that God has sent, look at how many times they're persecuted, they're judged, they're beaten, they're whipped, they're put to death, they're martyred, you know, because they're preaching the truth. So then, so then brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman but of the free. Uh, the last place, yeah, we'll do this and, and then we're done. Matthew 21. Because what I'm teaching tonight is what's known as replacement theology. A lot of people like to throw that term around as a curse word. Oh, you believe in replacement theology. Oh, I can't believe you believe that. We didn't replace Israel. You know, we didn't replace them. You're right, in a sense, because it's always been consist comprised of believers. As far as the Israel that's important in God's eyes. But Matthew 21 
who better to turn to than Jesus Christ himself? And let's see what Jesus says on this matter. Matthew 21, look at verse number 33. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went to, into a far country. So this guy bought a property, made a vineyard, he's got a wine press, he's got all this big, this big factory, right? This big plant. And he says, cool, I built this whole thing. Now I'm going to hire people to run this place, to, to, to make sure the vineyard's kept up on, make sure that they're pumping out the wine, make sure they're doing everything that, I, that I've set up here. And I'm going to go off and do some other business in another country. And I'm going to leave you guys here to take care of this. That's what he's saying in this parable. Verse 34. And when the time of the fruit drew near, because it's a vineyard, right? So the fruit's growing. He sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. So, hey, my grapes are growing. It's time. To, I, I want to receive now of my own property, right? So he sends his servants. Hey, go, go get me some of my fruit. Verse 35, and the husbandman took his servants. So the people who are watching over, that's the husbandman, the workers, the employees there, took his servants. They beat one killed another, and stoned another. Imagine that. The boss sends another one of his employees, and the employees are beating him up and killing him and stuff. He's like, I'm just trying to get what's mine. And they don't want to give it up. Verse 36, again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they'll reverence my son. He said, they have no respect for my servants. For these other people, I'm sending them. But you know what? If they have any respect for me at all, they'll respect my son. They're not going to treat him poorly because he's my son. Verse 38, but when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. This is the person who's going to receive all of this stuff that we're working for right now. That's the heir. Come. Let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. What a wicked thought. They're saying, let's, let's kill this guy and then we'll just steal this inheritance because who's going to be left now? That guy, you know, our boss is going to die and then we'll just take over this stuff. It'll just be ours. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? So he's, he's, he says this entire parable and he asks the question, they just killed his son. Now what's he going to do? What do you think he's going to do? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Because remember, all he wanted was to receive some of the fruits of his own property and of his own land. That's what he wanted. And these people failed to do it. They killed him. They, you know, they killed his son. So there's, there's, and they judged righteously. They said, yeah, that's what's going to happen. He's going to come in. He's going to destroy him and, and let other people take care of it. People who are actually going to listen to him and respect him and do his work and do his bidding. Makes sense, right? It's a very simple example. What's the application? Verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Hold on a second. So I'm going to take the kingdom from you. you. You have it right now. I'm taking it from you. I'm giving it to this guy over here. Sounds like this nation... Their job has been replaced. Amen. Isn't that what's happened? Hey, you're not doing your job. You go into work. If I go into work next week and my boss is like, hey, you haven't been doing your job. I've hired a replacement for you. You're fired. He's in. Yeah, we believe in replacement theology. Yep. God was using the nation of Israel, the physical nation of Israel, the nation to give his word, to be a light to the Gentiles. He did use them. He kept sending his prophets to him, though, his, his servants. 
saying, hey, you're not doing my work. Hey, you're supposed to be evangelizing. Hey, you're supposed to be following my commandments. Hey, you're supposed to be doing all this good stuff and you're not doing it. And he kept sending his servants and saying, I want to eat some fruit. I need you to do something for me. I need you to do something for me. And they weren't doing it. And they were beating him up and they were killing him. And he finally sends his son saying, well, they'll have respect unto my son. And what'd they do? They killed him. Jesus Christ, the son of the father, murdered. That's why he gave this example. Because he's saying, I'm done with you. I'm going to find other people who are willing to work for me. Because you're not doing it. The kingdom of God is taken from you and I'm giving it unto other people. And this is the way God works. And you know what? He's given it to another nation now, but he doesn't care if you're physically descended through that nation either. What he wants is workers. He cares about people who are willing to do the work for him. And he'll keep on moving his employment between different nations to find someone who's willing to do the work for him. Because that's what he wants done. He wanted the fruit. And if you're not doing any work, you're not going to be bearing any fruit. Verse 44 says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, grind him to power, powder. Verse 45, And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. So the Pharisees knew exactly what he was saying. This didn't go over their heads. He gave them the parable. He's like, he's talking about us. We're not, we're not bringing forth the fruit. And, they, they, and it bothered them so much they wanted to kill him. That's how angry. And just, it's like, it, they hear this parable saying, you're murderers. You're killing people of God. So what do they want to do? They want to kill the person of God. Like, like, you're mad because he's calling you murderer and you're a murderer. And again, when it says the kingdom of God, this isn't talking about their eternal salvation because it's talking about a nation. A physical nation doesn't get saved and go to heaven. Individual souls get saved and go to heaven. The nation that God will use, like I believe God's been using America as a nation to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's who's been doing the works in the past few hundred years. Doing evangelism, sending out missionaries, preaching the gospel, doing all this work to, to bring forth fruit. But you know what? It seems to be dying down and slowing down. Any nation that's willing to put forth the work, God will lift them up and say, I'm going to use you. Doesn't matter where you're from. That could be in China. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's not looking like it's going to be China now, but, you know, I'm just saying, it, it, it doesn't matter. As long as any group of people are going to turn to God, they're going to turn to Christ and say, yeah, we're going to do this. He'll use anyone. We have a lively hope. Going back to this morning, we have a lively hope. God's word can bring dead bones back to life. God's word can bring the unbelieving Jew back into the inheritance if they would simply believe. It's that powerful. Israel wanted hope in Ezekiel 37. God told them, prophesied about the hope, prophesied about the resurrection, prophesied about Jesus Christ. Israel today, when the, as Christ rejectors, they have no hope. But they can have hope if they'll just believe. They can truly be a child of Abraham. They may think they're children of Abraham now, but they're not. But they can be a child of Abraham through faith. They can be a child of promise too. That's what truly matters. It's, it's not the outward appearance. It's not the flesh. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female because we're all one in Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teaching from Scripture. God, I know there's a lot of people out there that are vehement in their support over the, the Christ-rejecting nation of Israel today, dear Lord. And I pray, I pray, Honestly, dear Lord, that you would open up their eyes, that you would help them to understand your words, and that especially if they're, if they're saved, if they're born-again believers, dear God, I pray that you please stir up their spirits to read their Bibles 
and that you would uh, stop the mouths of the, the, the preachers that are preaching lies and that you would um, just, just help us all to, to know what your will truly is and it's not to support people that hate you and that we should be getting out of all the, the entanglements that we're, we find ourselves in and, and not deceiving ourselves into thinking that we're going to be blessed by blessing people that hate you. God, I pray that you would please just help us to, to have a spirit of wisdom. And I pray that you please help us individually here. I know it's a big task, but just help us to do our part and to serve you um, to, to, to our fullest extent. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.